Hey, Austin here with Tour Carterville Magazine, and I'm here today with Lisa Harris, um, rodeo clown and ex bullfighter. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into the 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 clown business and the bullfighting. Well, I when I graduated from school, I had a football scholarship, and I was waiting for the season to start and the fall practice to start. And a buddy and I heard about a, a rodeo over at Arlington, Tennessee with a little Sunday afternoon thing. And we didn't hear much about the, as much about the rodeo as we did about the girls that were over there. <laughs> and uh, cowgirls, tight jeans and all that. So we went over there to see that. And I got over there and got interested in the bull riding. Decided to get in the bull riding. The first rodeo I ever saw, I got in the bull riding on for just to see if I, I thought I could do it. Yeah. Learn real quick, I couldn't. And uh, so there was, it kind of made me mad because I got thrown so quick. And so a buddy of mine and I decided to go back there the next week and try it again. And, just, <laughs> and then then one day, a uh, the rodeo clown, the bullfighter, the one that took the, to save the cowboys, mm -hmm. he had, his car broke down. He couldn't make it. So I thought, and I'd been watching him and they had a lot of football moves and I thought I'd like to try that. So I told the guy, I said, I'll do that. And so uh, that's how it got started. And then they started saying, well, won't you come back next week and we'll give you your entry fees. We'll pay your entry fees in the bull riding if you'll do that. Oh, wow. So I did that until I went to college. Okay. Gotcha. And then it just kind of got out of hand from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> so you touched on it a little bit, but, um, you know, we all know that, you know, Rodeo Clowns is, you know, it's comedy, and, but there's other parts to the job too. If you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what what all is the is the clown doing in the rodeo and other than comedy? Yeah, as well. well, back then, Rodeo Clowns, they, we were called Rodeo Clown Bullfighters, mm -hmm. all one deal. And you were required to do both. You, you, uh, you could be a pretty good bullfighter, and if you did comedy, you worked a lot. Mm -hmm. You could be the best bullfighter in the world, but if you didn't, if you weren't funny, if you didn't do comedy, you you didn't work. Right. So, uh, but a bullfighter's job is to to take the, the the bull off of the cowboy once the whistle is blown and he's made the ride, or if he gets bucked off or any time during that. And what that amounts to is. Um, you pretty much have to be, make yourself a more desirable target than a cowboy laying okay. down on the ground that can't get up. You have to go in there. You have to, to and that's the reason for the bright colors. Okay. That's the reason for a, 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 the, the baggy pants and things like that that we fought in right. because you could make your moves. Uh, and, and most of the cowboys would wear darker clothes, something that wasn't so attractive right. to the bulls. That when you went in there and you got their attention, you make the bull come to you. And then it's your job to outmaneuver the bull and until you can get to safety. Okay. And that, that way the, the, the cowboy can, can leave. So uh, it's, it's imperative that, that, that bullfighters are there. Uh, bull riders won't get on them without them. Right. Well, it sounds like a pretty tough job. Yeah. For me. <laughs> well, well I, I really enjoyed it. I I, um, I loved to fight. It was a challenge, uh, and people would always say, "Well, uh, you know, aren't you scared?" Well, naturally, yeah. If you're not, <laughs> you know, you're not. You're not <laughs> you're right. 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 <laughs> so, uh, so uh, but I don't think it was fear as much as there's a fine line between fear and respect. Mm. You know, I. Uh, respected my dad but i also feared my dad you know <laughs> so there's there's a fine line and and, and you just don't want to you don't want to get in the ring with a bull if you don't have respect for him because you won't last long right right and, and, and because they're so big and so powerful you have to use that for your advantage you're able to move in a tighter circle you're able to move just a little quicker. You don't have to move back. I was probably the, I was probably the slowest college football player to be a receiver ever. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the biggest tackle on the on the defensive team on the other side could catch me if I was out in the flat. <laughs> but I, 
I was able to to get run my patterns quickly. I could make my cuts. Okay. I could be from zero to, to one real right. quick. The lateral movement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the cheerleader could catch me if I tried to outrun them. And that's <laughs> what they do. They, every time they wanted 10 yards, well, they passed to me. I'd get it. Of course, they'd tackle me right away. Right. But that's what helped me in my bullfighting because I could go from here to here. You don't have to move that far. Right. You know, to be, but you better move there quick. And, and, and you got to wait till the last minute. Right, right. Second. It's, how did you how did you learn to, to get a feel for those things just by doing it? Or did you have someone that kind of taught you the ropes? Like, you know, this is where you need to stand. These are the kind of movements you need to make. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I was watching the, the first bullfighter I ever saw. I was watching him, and I was watching a lot of his moves being uh, moves that I used in football. Mm-hmm. And so that, I was familiar with that. But uh, I was raised on a farm. And I was raised around animals, cows, bulls, and it helps to have what we call cow sense, to be able to kind of think like a cow yeah. does, or or to watch the. It, it, it's amazing what you can what you can tell about a bull by just seeing him in the pen. You could tell by the way when you fight them and you're that close to them and your hands are on them all the time. Right. It's little things you pick up, like the way he moves his ears, uh, the way he moves his head, the right. way he he walks if he. Uh, or the way he runs, if his feet cross over, all of those things you, you have to learn to uh, to survive. And, and they, they can get a little bit more predictable in their movements. Yeah. And that's where they want you kind of get a feel right. for what you know. And then you don't you try not to get too familiar with them because you start expecting them to do something and they and they okay. don't. Right. So and then it's over with. Right. But it's it's uh, I learned because. And what helped me a lot, because I never watched another bullfighter. I didn't know what they did. Mm. So I learned to fight bulls my own style. Okay. And I got used to that style. And so when I went in from the, what we call amateur rodeo division into the uh, professional rodeo business, Mm -hmm. into the big world, my style was totally different from anybody else's, which kind of set me Apart. Aside, yeah. Mm-hmm. From and the same thing with comedy. I wasn't familiar with rodeo clown comedy, so right. I didn't know what they did. Right. And, and they all had a a, a kind of a, a, a rodeo style, and I didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, my comedy was totally different. And then when I went into that big league, there I was, totally different kind of bullfighter with different moves. Uh, right. And my my comedy was totally different from anybody else's mm-hmm. comedy, and it was all by mistake. It wasn't by <laughs> design. It was just I dumbed right. into it, as my dad. <laughs> so you're kind of giving everybody else um, something that you know they hadn't really seen before because you just didn't know exactly. as much. I didn't about know it. the difference. Right. right. I didn't know the correct way to do this right. and that. You know. Well, let's talk a little bit about the comedy side of it. I know you know. Obviously, you said that you're football player um but how did you know that that you kind of had a knack for the comedy thing uh how did how did that start in, in getting into that? well i guess um my high school principal told me one time when i was in the ninth grade he said lisa you're going I, I i spent a lot of time in his office and uh it was because i was doing <laughs> making people laugh in class and that kind of thing <laughs> And, uh, but he told me when I was a freshman, in fact, he bet me $5. He said, I'm going to bet you $5 that you don't graduate. He said, and he, you need to learn to do something besides clowning because you're not going to make a living clowning. <laughs> and, and, and when he retired and went on the speaking tour, that was always one of his first comments you need to watch what you say because it might come back to bite you and 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 that's what i did i and when i graduated the night i graduated he gave me a diploma and in, when i opened it up there was a five dollar bill folded and it was in he paid me wow. off wow. That, I, that i that i did graduate wow but i had uh i did a i remember one of my english teachers one time uh, she said, uh, she threw me out of class, sent me to the principal, to Ms. Osteen's office, the principal, 
And he said, why are you down? What did you, what did you do this time? And I said, all I did, I scratched my I scratched my ear. And he said, you can't, you don't get sent to the office for scratching your ear. <laughs> right. And I said, I did, I scratched my ear. Well, he, Miss, after a while, Miss Gregg was my English teacher. She said, she explained it to him, the reason he is down here because he did scratch. He said, he doesn't scratch his ear like this. He scratches his other ear like this. <laughs> and he reaches over here to scratch that one. And, and that, that makes people, she said, why? That's the problem. He doesn't scratch the ear that's closest to me. He wraps his arm all the way around and scratches the other ear. And the kids behind think that's funny. <laughs> and I said, so I go up there, I get whippings because I scratched the wrong ear with the wrong hand. <laughs> so anyway, I started, I had a band. I was in the, I was in the, uh, uh, I was in the, the, the school band started out as a viola player. Now, viola is a big violin. Right. Just, and, and, and me, and that was the only instrument available. Mm -hmm. So I had to take it, and, and me, you know, there I was playing basketball and football and all of the sports and everything, and, and fighting everything in the school and all, and they had me playing the viola. Well, I, I just kind of wasn't a viola kind of person. And, but I did learn to play the viola. And then uh, when a guy graduated, I got to go on drums. So that's when I started playing drums in high school. Okay. Then I went to the orchestra and played the drum. Then I went to a drum set with the orchestra. And then I uh, created my own band called the Echoes. And uh, that was my first was my first band, and that's why I first got into music. And then I went from the Echoes. Uh, we played for the high school dances around here, and mm -hmm. and then I, I developed comedy routines to go with it. So okay. that's kind of where the type of stand up. Gotcha. Of course, when I went into rodeo, my stand up came in handy because I had a lot of ad libs, and I. Right. Uh, was able to do a lot of that kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. Rodeos are full of breaks and cracks and breakdowns. You have a calf that don't want to come out, a, a bull that don't want to come right. out, or a horse gets upside down. It's all kinds of little breaks in there. Right. And you've got 10,000 people sitting there waiting. Uh, those little, those are voids in mm -hmm. my opinion. Right. And I do seminars now in, in Las Vegas, climbing seminars, and, and I tell them then, I said, but you need to consider yourself as a clown. Uh, you're the glue that kind of glues all of these cracks and crevices and breakdowns. Yeah, holds the show together. Yeah, yeah that yeah. puts it together without spreading glue all over the whole rodeo. Right, right. So it, it's, it's uh, and that's what I do is try to fill those little gaps mm -hmm. where I break that with a piece of comedy. Mm -hmm. And people are, are listening to that or watching that, they don't even realize that there was a gap there, you know, or, right. or right. whatever. So it, it's, uh, and I was good at that. I, I, I was good at ad living and learned to do that. And mainly, I, I guess, just doing, doing comedy right. every day. Well, that's really cool. And you, you touched a little bit on how, you know, uh, when you got your start, it was, it was comedy and it was bullfighting. And it, you kind of had to do both. Um, how has how's the rodeo kind of changed over the years? Uh, it's evolved and now uh, there's there's really no such thing as clown bullfighters anymore. Okay. You got your clowns and you got your bullfighters. Uh, and then you got your barrel men. They're the people that just that sit in the barrel and, and most often do comedy. Mm -hmm. But the the um, the bullfighters now uh, they kind of would like to think of themselves as athletes more than than comedy. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and and it will sometimes offend them if you ask them, you know, are you a rodeo clown? No, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a bullfighter. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so were we. But a lot of times we fought bulls and we got out of a hairy situation or a bad situation, come right out and do a piece of comedy, right. you know, to lighten things up again. Right. But. And, and your comedy people now don't fight bulls. So okay. it's uh, it's just totally separated. And, that's, and you're still doing the, the comedy I, I'm part of it now. I'm still doing the comedy part. And, and the main reason I'm still in the business, I'm 82 years old. Should have, well, I fought bulls till I was 52, and you're, and you're actually 
the life expectancy of a bullfighter is probably 30 or 31 or so, and you're, you know, you got to be thankful. They're retired around 30, 31? Yeah. yeah. Okay, wow. And so how long were you fighting bulls? All 36 said, years. 36 years. Yeah. And people usually retire from that around 30. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> right. that's that's incredible. Yeah, that's... and uh, so it, it, it's now, the reason I guess I still am in demand is because they don't have the clown bullfighters anymore. And, and I, I fought bulls and learned comedy. And when I retired from fighting bulls, I moved right on into comedy and there was just big gap. Yeah. Where <clears throat> there's no comedy. Yeah. And there's very few of them now uh, that just say, okay, I want to learn comedy. Right. And, uh, and what they don't realize is the comedy pays three or four times more than a bullfighter does. It, there's right. a bullfighter on every every, every corner, but there's right. you know, very few comedy people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I guess now doing the comedy thing, you have a little bit less chance of, of getting hurt then? Oh, oh yeah, a lot yeah, less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot less than before. Uh, unless yeah. you just stand around and not pay attention. I'm still in the arena doing the bull riding. Okay. So I, I, I have to be able to get up and get out of the way. Right. And, uh, always on your toes, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and two, I still I'm still coaching a lot of young bullfighters. I, okay. I, I, I do a lot of that, so gotcha. I'm in the arena with them and, and can talk to them, and and I enjoy that part because it's I don't get to fight bulls anymore, and I miss it. Do you? Oh yeah, I really do. And mm -hmm. I can see a bull that comes out and maybe not. You, you have different levels of, of, of athletes and bulls. You've got some bulls that are just outstanding athletes. I mean, they can move, they can cross over, they can cut back, they, they're just good athletes. Wow. And then you've got these others that are not quite as good athletes, mm -hmm. but they're mad, they want to fight somebody, they want to get somebody, but they're <laughs> just not quite capable of doing it. And yeah. those now, when I see them come out, I, my mouth waters, I'd still love to get in there on them yeah. and just, just yeah. feel them. Right. But, it's a. Uh, I pay attention while I'm in the arena now because I, I've been hit so many times and. I'm sure that you've been hurt quite a few times. Yeah, I've had my back broken twice. Wow. I've had over a hundred fractures. Um, uh, I've had everything from brain concussions to torn up knees, ankles, and but I. But I'm, you miss it. Yeah. I, <laughs> but I, you I, miss I, it. I, you know, and every time I got hit. I always thought I did something wrong, or either the bull was just a better athlete than than I was, or he outsmarted me. So right. it was it was a competitive thing to me to get back in there and try him again, right. to, to to see if I can outmove him. Right. Well, that's very cool, and I I want to bring it back around to the Carterville a little bit. Um, you told me a story recently about how you always wanted to make sure that, that people knew at the rodeos that you were you were at and performing at that the people knew that you were from Carterville. Right. And a lot of times that they would, you know, introduce you as, you know, from being from Memphis. Yeah. And and that you wanted it to be from Carterville. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that? Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, of course, a prime example is the Calgary Stampede. Uh, probably one of the largest rodeos in the world. And I worked it for like, 18 years or something mm -hmm. like that in a row or more, maybe close to 20. And when you're out of the country, and I have, I've rodeoed in South Africa, I've been all over Canada, everywhere. But when you're out of this area, people don't know where Collierville is. They all, they all know where Memphis is. Right. And it's so easy for them and, and to say, you know, uh, because it was so close to Memphis that, that I was from Memphis. And I always corrected them. Sometimes I corrected them in the arena. You know, in front of the people, I let them know, no, I'm not. I'm from Calgary. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, it, it, and at Calgary, it's like 65,000, it holds like 65,000 people. Wow. There, and, and it's always full, full for 10 days in a row. So I mean, it's just huge. Wow. And, uh, and it got to the point where I corrected the Canadians so many times. <laughs> about t t say that I'm in, from Collierville, that I got where I could just go out in front of this crowd and there was a lot of them there from, they were, they were from everywhere, 
all over the world, but a lot came every year. And I'd say, folks, where am I from? The whole place would say, Collierville. They know? knew. They yeah. knew at that point. You bet. Yeah, right. And I'd say, where's Collierville? Tennessee. Wow. You know? so, well, that's cool. That's really cool. I, yeah, I've always been proud of my hometown. Yeah, and you, so you were born and raised in, in Carter? Actually, no. I was born in Mississippi. Okay. Um, I was born in, in Lake Comrade, Mississippi, which is just outside of Memphis, what, 15 miles or something? Right. And but my folks moved here when I was five, and and I moved with them. Uh, mm -hmm. they, I was just five, so, <laughs> and so I, I thought yeah. it'd be the best thing for me right, to right. come with them. Yeah, they probably did too. <laughs> and uh, so I, I left, and, and and I've been here. We've been in Collierville yeah. ever since then. I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in Carterville. Oh then. yeah, a lot. Yeah. But you know what? I I, I I'm so proud of the square. Uh, you know, in our downtown square, it's it's it still feels like home. My folks owned a restaurant here on the square for for years and years and years, and we owned another restaurant out uh, uh, outside of town here in you know in Collierville. And so mm -hmm. I was and and where uh, the old post office was, where uh, the new restaurant over there is, that was a it was a duplex there. We lived there for a while before we bought a farm and moved out on the farm so mm -hmm. well, what I do you raised right here what do you think about the you know like i said a lot a lot has changed and i'm sure you've seen a lot change but you know with the square now there's a lot of changes taking place what do you think about the direction of where the town's oh, going now? i absolutely love it i i, I uh I, um the way the participation now uh with the people in Collierville with the square like coming up for the concerts up in and using the square mm -hmm. you know uh that's uh, it's even though even though it's changed a lot in appearance, it really hadn't to me. Really, uh, I can I can because I've been here for you know what seventy something years, mm -hmm. um, and I, I the buildings I can tell you what used to be in that building three or four right. people back or whatever. Right. Like they say in in Collierville, you know you. You're not really a from Collierville, or you don't own a house in Collierville uh, for a long time because that's Miss Wilson's house. You know, <laughs> where do you live? I live. Uh, oh, you live in Miss Wilson's house. Well, you, right. you, you don't. Right. Even though you buy it, you don't get to own it for a long. long. <laughs> yeah. They got to forget about Miss Wilson. Yeah. They got to put their time you know, in first. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. So yeah. it, it, it's pecking. It, it's pecking order. Yeah. But Collierville is just. I, I've been all over this world and I've traveled me and many miles and and when I drive back into here every time I come off a trip I'm just it's home I'm just yeah. glad to be home well Carterville's definitely lucky to have you and uh, we appreciate you coming by it's always good talking to you uh, thank you yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I just love being home <laughs> yep. Collierville is home yeah, that's right it absolutely is and you know we, we couldn't be happier to be here now ourselves on the square so well, thanks again. You betcha. I appreciate it. You betcha.